Easy from Eddie Hernandez. Hey, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to GAW Academy Storm Chaser. Last Friday, we saw After Party. It was absolutely nuts. It featured Alistair Black versus Walter, one of the, one of the best, most horrifyingly brutal matches that you will ever see. You should go back and check that out if you haven't seen it. But now we welcome to the ring our own Academy Champion, Catherine Sacomodo, won the three-way dance for that title at Bash at the Beach in the main event. And now, after losing to Baleska Pierce, she is here in her first match since then. The woman tasked with fighting an undeniably pissed off champion is Suzuki. It's unfortunate that she has drawn uh, the uh, short straw, I guess you could say. Although, I mean, you could see it a bit as maybe a blessing in disguise almost because, you know, Baleska Pierce, her first night in the company, beat Catherine Sakamoto. And that's why Pierce is now the number one contender for Sakamoto's Academy Championship. We've been in kind of a holding pattern ever since then as. Catherine has kind of avoided the uh, the arena, and Baleska is presumably training for her title match. So Suzuki could potentially make this a very messy situation here if she were to be another competitor to beat Catherine Sakamoto as champion. She could really gum up the works here, I think. And it'll be interesting to see. You know, the funny thing about Catherine as champion is the fact that she looked so good in that three-way dance against Lazara and Yamamoto, and now in winning that match, she eliminated probably her two biggest challengers at the time because Lazara and Yamamoto are not allowed to challenge for the title while Catherine is still champion. So she looked so good in that match, but ever since then, it's almost like she's lost her confidence, or uh, maybe more aptly, she has been uh, a little bit... Hang on. What? What's going on? So dark. It's Valeska Pierce, the number one contender. She's come out, and she's not scheduled to be in this match. But I wonder. I wonder what her plan here is. This is the this is the first time we've seen her at least near a ring since she beat the champion. So I'm, I'm, wondering ex I'm wondering what her plan here is. Again, she's not in this match as far as I know, but Baleska beat Catherine Sakamoto with the neck piercer uh, about a month ago now in Catherine's first match as champion. It was non-title, but it made Baleska Pierce the number one contender to the Academy Championship. So now, here she is, celebrating to the crowd. Catherine is stunned. Catherine doesn't even want to look in her direction. Her potential challenger for the title, Valeska Pierce. I believe that she has just come out here to watch, and yes, she will be ringside as this match begins. So will this throw off the champion at all? Catherine now has to deal with Baleska Pierce being in the opposite corner. I don't expect Pierce to get involved at all. That doesn't seem to be her style, but Catherine mentally, as I was saying before Baleska entered the arena, I think that Catherine is kind of dealing with, I guess you would say she's already hit that peak. Oh, beautiful DDT from Suzuki. So, with Catherine hitting her peak already, it's almost like she's gone down in terms of emotional involvement. That might be a big reason why Baleska Pierce was able to get the better of her small package driver, and Suzuki holds on, Catherine kicks out. So if we were to assume that that's the case, then Catherine now not being in the best state mentally, now having to deal with her number one contender, future challenger for her title at ringside, We'll see what Catherine makes of this. Suzuki with a big lariat sends her into the corner. And you can see Baleska just getting into the mind of Catherine just a little bit. And honestly, Catherine kind of deserves it after what 
she had to say to Lazara and Yamamoto in the build-up to the Bash of the Beach main event. I gotta say, it's well-deserved. Suzuki looking for a powerbomb. Catherine rolls through, sunset flip. Suzuki tried to roll back towards the ropes. Catherine held on. Suzuki, beautiful core strength, turns it back around and Catherine kicks out. That's what Suzuki needs to do. She's gotta be quicker than the champ and a nice snap suplex to answer. Irish whip into the corner goes Suzuki. Catherine maybe starting to settle into this match a little bit, knowing that Beleska is there in the corner. Suzuki went for a takedown. Catherine stops her. Suzuki answers with a big shot. Leg caught by the champ. And now Catherine, beautiful go behind in a German suplex. Catherine's not doing a whole lot in this match, but maybe she doesn't need to. Suzuki's in the drop zone now. Baleska watching Catherine stare at the lights. Comes down right on the abdomen of Suzuki and Catherine does get the win and stares down Baleska Pierce after it's done. Wow. Catherine looked very shaken early in this match, but she really figured it out as time went on. Here was the powerbomb attempt countered by Catherine and that really, in a lot of ways, symbolized the turning point of the match where Catherine started to settle in. Baleska in the corner watching Catherine hit stare at the lights and now I'm very pleased to say we will have Baleska on headset for an interview. Baleska, you've been named number one contender to Catherine's Academy Championship. Did you expect to be competing at this level this early? You know, I'm glad you asked that because I get to get this off my chest. Honestly, yes and no. I expected to be firing on all cylinders right out the gate, but I didn't expect to immediately make the mark the way that I did. I, I had no idea who the champ was going to be when I finally debuted, but, you know, then I, I come out here, I see this spoiled brat just running her mouth. My friends backstage weren't planning on doing much about it, so I guess I just said, screw it. I'll, I'll show up a little early to slap some humility into another rookie. We've just heard confirmation from Jason Parker. That match will happen at America the Beautiful 2 on July 5th. That gives you a month to prepare. What do you feel like you need to do to beat Catherine for that title? I'm honestly loving the job Jason has been doing. He's great, he's really smart. He doesn't let people run wild without backlash, which I respect. And with him making this official and giving us, I, I guess both, uh, uh, giving us both a month of prep before tearing each other apart, I feel like I'm gonna have to show everyone here why I've dominated every women's division I've ever been in. I want Catherine to understand what she's getting into. I'm not Lazara, I won't get sloppy. I'm not Yamamoto, I won't fall on my own sword, and I'm not Catherine's sister. I don't lose a few matches and take a back seat to my siblings. Trust me, come America the Beautiful 2, I'm dropping that bitch again. You know I wanted to sit back, party, prepare to take the Academy Championship, but that wrinkled old dumbass Roja had to put my name back in his mouth. I'm not surprised, of course, his whole career, he makes himself relevant by leeching off younger, more talented wrestlers. But whatever he says, know that this is his last desperate attempt to stay relevant and make no mistake. I will make sure it is the last time. Listen to the reaction for Flyboy as he comes out. We just saw him recently in his first match since a disgusting attack on La Tortuga Roja a few weeks ago. Flyboy took down Overload and now it is his desire apparently to go after the Academy Champion, Kurt Andrews. I think Flyboy will probably have to get in line. We've seen more goings on on Twitter. We showed you some of that. Last week, well, we've seen even more Kurt Andrews and Derek Cole getting into it on Twitter this week. So Derek Cole also has his eyes on the Academy Champion. It's a growing list of wrestlers that want a shot at the Buccaneer. And it's exactly what you'd expect. Andrews currently holds the top prize. 
everyone else wants it. And if you have a choice between Kurt Andrews and Midnight as your two champions, apparently people would rather take Kurt Andrews. I'm not exactly sure that it's uh, that easy of a choice to pick Kurt Andrews over Midnight. Both men are absolutely terrifying and at this point unbeatable. Flyboy thinks though that he might have the answer. Well, before Flyboy disappeared after an interview gone wrong at Storm Chaser Sydney, he was briefly teaming with Mexican Shia. Both men have really gone their separate ways since then, and Shia last week very impassioned addressing Lancelot and what Lancelot has said to him. But apparently they were booked to team up once again. This will be the first time these two have teamed in about three months. So it'll be interesting to see now that they've gone in such opposite directions how they mesh together. I mean, they seemed like a promising tag team before, if only just because of the talent of both men. But both men coming in, there was kind of, I guess you would say, a reputation around them that maybe they hadn't been living up to the expectations that they had set for themselves. So apparently they've decided to deal with that in two very different ways. So I guess we'll find out now if those two opposite mentalities really make a difference or if they can get together and, and have a good tag team match. Because I'll tell you what, they will need one here given their opponents. I said that they will need a good performance here because it's the Titans that they have to go against. The tag team champions, always incredibly dangerous. And they were dangerous before. So now think about the fact that they have the Titans rules now that we saw them use against Woods Club a few weeks ago. So just add that into the back pocket. But honestly, you don't even need Titans rules when you look at these two men. A former Mr. Universe in lighter and just a massive hulk of a man in Dagonite. The giant, giant killer. That man is 20 years old. Can you believe that? 20 years old. Tag team champion. The Titans are as dangerous as they come. And now we will get to see if Flyboy and Mexican Shia have enough to beat the Titans right now. Flyboy in to start. It'll be lighter to start things off for the Titans and immediately with go behind into a German suplex. At this point, it's a question of when the Titans rules will be invoked, not if. Now Leiter immediately trying to steal it here from Flyboy. Tries to roll through with the cover, Flyboy kicks out. I think that's a comment on Leiter believing that Flyboy could easily get on top here. And Mexican Shia stops Leiter from going nuts and Flyboy with a poison Rana. There's a little bit of chemistry there between the two new tag partners. Mexican Shia stops Leiter in his tracks. It looks like he was going to run wild on Flyboy. Instead, Flyboy going to showcase this incredible athleticism. Two big drop kicks. Catches that lariat. Neck breaker. And Flyboy now looking good against the tag champ. The matchup of size versus speed. We see it all the time in the academy. We don't have weight divisions. So this is not new to us. Flyboy with a standing Spanish fly. Beautifully done, but Leiter comes and answers back. Frequent tags are going to be necessary in a match like this. Flyboy ducks underneath and hits him big right from Flyboy. And now it looks like Flyboy will get himself a tag, and he does. Mexican Shia into the match for the first time. And these two are actually holding their own pretty decently against the Titans. We'll see if Shia can do the same. Hard Irish whip off the turnbuckle. And now Leiter with a huge choke slam. So Mexican Shia not doing quite as well as Flyboy had done. But, you know, to be fair to him, Flyboy wasn't even doing that well until Shia got himself involved. Deadlift military press from Leiter, and this is the incredible strength 
of Lighter, tag team veteran and Lighter, God Slayer, giant boot delivered to the forehead of Mexican Shia, and Shia kicked out. It was pretty early in the match for that, but Flyboy eats a bulldog courtesy of the seven foot Dagonite. Lighter up on the top, just surveying the situation here. Flyboy to his feet. Dagonite still in, I think jawing with Flyboy and the referee as Leiter goes back to work on Mexican Shia. Referee at his back turn. Shia able to get himself back in this match into the corner. Goes Leiter. Leiter fights his way out of it. Standing switch and Shia going for a tag here. But Flyboy, Flyboy's off the apron. Flyboy's left. Flyboy's walking away from this match. Shia in there alone as Flyboy is just left completely. Hey. Flyboy did the right thing here because, and I hate to break this to you, Shia, the Titans rules clearly state we cannot be disqualified for being in the ring at the same time. I mean, you could have been doing that the whole time. What's wrong with you guys? Oh my God, you are kidding me. You are kidding me. The Titans rules my ass. Lighter and Dagonite in the ring at the same time. And Leiter going to work on Shia, who is now without a partner. This is just a bloodbath here, waiting to happen, and both Leiter and Dagonite going to work. I cannot believe that, so, oh my God, that someone is not out here to stop this from happening. This is Flyboy's fault. In reality, Shia trying to use his speed to get out of this, but I don't see how on earth he can fight his way out of this situation. Leiter has him up. Elevated DDT. Well, Mexican Shia looked like he might have a little bit of hope. I think that's gone by the wayside now. Shia gets the boot in to Dagonite, but Dagonite's still working on him. Now up onto the top rope he goes. Both Leiter and Dagonite taking their shots. This is ugly, but right now it's effective. And look at this, Lighter all the way from the top. Lighter or Dagonite with a huge superplex. My goodness. They're both in. I can't even keep things straight. Dagonite rolls him over, going for a cover. It looked like Lighter was ready to finish it. Dagonite, no, Shia kicked out again. Mexican Shia trying to persuade everyone that there is some hope here as he's working two on one against the Titans. That hope is over. Call from Olympus and Dagonite comes in to clear up, makes the cover and the Titans with the Titans rules actually go on and win this match. I can't believe what I have seen here folks. Flyboy leaves his partner, walks out of this match. And Leiter and Dagonite invoke the Titans rules. They say they can both be in there without being disqualified. This is just, it's sickening folks to see the tag team champions act like this. But this is what we've come to expect from them. The Titans rules, that's what this means. Here's another look at the call from Olympus from Leiter. Dagonite was there watching the whole time. There he goes, call from Olympus and Leiter. Calls for Dagonite to come make the cover. Dagonite does. And just like that, the Titans win. Another successful match for them, albeit probably the easiest they'll ever have in their entire lives after Flyboy leaves his partner in. Folks, coming up next week, we have a big match to open the show. You know how we love doing this. Derek Cole, win or lose in the main event coming up next, or coming up later, I should say. Cole will be in a three-way dance with two other young stars, Ramon Gutierrez and Igris. All three men under the age of 26. All three have incredible promise, and we will get to see all three in the ring three-way dance that is next week right here on storm chaser make sure you do not miss it first off you don't run nothing all talking no team bluffing my squad we all dream crushing we ain't rushing no discussion all i know is us made for this for it is ridiculous to me that we had to sit through that two-on-one attack by the titans but unfortunately 
they're tag champions and somehow they keep getting a hold of these damn contracts. We got to talk to Jason Parker about this, about how we can maybe stop it. But what I do know is this match is going to be a banger. Xavier Cross has looked better and better each time that he has been on our screens, whether here or on GAW Dark. He's compiled a one in three record, but you know, one of those losses was to Midnight for the Raw Championship. So certainly no harm, no shame in losing a match like that. And from Cross's perspective, already just four matches in, he's fought for a title here. It's been a pretty good run for him. Meanwhile, Ramon Gutierrez making his debut on Storm Chaser. He's compiled a 3-0 record over on Dark. So if you're not a regular viewer of GAW Dark over in Atlanta, you should go watch some of Ramon's stuff. He has been excellent. He's coming off a win over the newly debuted Chandler Marcy. Uh, you should also go watch Dark to learn about him. He has an incredible story going from college football standout to professional wrestler. But Gutierrez has also put up wins over, uh, over as I said, Marcy and Lance Woods as well. This guy has looked awfully good, and of course he also beat Mexican Shia in his debut. This match is going to be a lot of fun. Gutierrez is a luchador through and through. He began training when he was 11 years old at his first professional match at 16, and he has been all over the world wrestling predominantly in Mexico, but he's been to the European independent scene. He's wrestled in Japan. He has wrestled everywhere. Xavier Cross, by contrast, has wrestled for just one other promotion before coming to GAW. That is uh, Second City Wrestling over in Chicago. But Cross himself traveled the world as well as a professional hockey player. We've talked about him before. So these two guys have very, very different experiences when it comes to their journeys in professional wrestling and very different styles as well. Cross is a brawler and a submission specialist with that Cronwald Hawkslayer. Ramon is a luchador and pretty much one of the best that you will see at least at this age. I said that that three-way dance coming next week features all men under the age of 26. Ramon Gutierrez just 24 years old. Derek Cole is the oldest in that match. 26 years old. And then, of course, Igris coming in at 20. So you want to cross-section to the future of GAW. It is coming next week, and you're getting a sense of it right here. Cross, big backbreaker. Xavier Cross with that Cronwald Hawk Slayer. Look out for the standing cutter. That's what he uses to set it up. Meanwhile, Ramon Gutierrez, I feel like every time he's in, we see new offensive moves from him. Big Larius from Xavier Cross. Ducks one and comes in with a third. Of course, the Dorota is his favorite, but he's used a whole lot of other offensive moves to put guys away. Cross sends him over the top. Gutierrez is one of the quickest men that you will see in general admission wrestling. And when you think about some of the guys that he has shared the ring with, you can see why even at such a young age, he looks so experienced I and mean, he seems to really know what he's doing and you can see that oh look at this Dorota from Gutierrez talk about experience he caught Xavier Cross coming into the ring caught him with the Dorota and Ramon Gutierrez gets the win well he's been in the ring with the likes of Chavo Guerrero Homicide Hernandez Juventud Blue Demon Talk about the kind of guys that he's been in the ring with and you learn things like that. He knows that he needs to get back in the ring. Xavier Cross a little slow on the uptake. And Ramon catches him right as he comes back in. Drops him with a Dorota. Beautiful, another look at that. And that is, uh, again, one of the many offensive moves that Ramon Gutierrez uses to great effect. Look out for him in the three-way dance coming next week. 
That's going to be so much fun. But coming up next here is our main event, Derek Cole versus Santonico, two undefeated men. I can't wait to see this. Look, Jason, you know I never back down from a challenge, but I, I also want what's best for the GAW Academy. We all know Flyboy as champion, remaking GAW in his image would damage this company, possibly irreparably. Look what the man just did. I know, I know. I, look, I don't like what that Mook is doing any more than you do. But he's got a right, same as anyone else, to try to become champion. I'm not going to play favorites here. I'm not asking you to, but I know how tough you've got it, even on a good day. I just want to make my frustrations clear to someone I trust, you know. I, I've got enough mooks, like you say, on my arse to be worried about someone who'd ruin the company if he got the title. Man, I'd sympathize with you, brother. I really do. You've got a bang-up job as champion. Everyone knows that. Look, I, all I can tell you is, if Flyboy tries something, he'll have me to answer to. We'll just have to wait to see if he earns his way into a match, like I said. He's got the same rights as everyone else. Thanks, Jason. Look at Derek Cole rocking some new threads here. I love to see it from him. You know, he made enough money in his professional career that uh, he can get himself some new digs. And I know that I, I sound like I'm from the 80s when I say things like that. I swear to you I was born in the late 90s. But whatever, that aside, I want to talk briefly about Jason Parker because, look, Kurt Andrews brings up a, a very serious point. Flyboy just walked out of a match how could you have this guy anywhere near the Academy title? That's not who you want representing. That's a good point. But Jason Parker, you know what? I respect him. And he says, look, as long as Flyboy's winning, there's nothing I can do. We've seen so many times and we've all had bosses that get themselves involved and, and you know, start meddling in, in things that they shouldn't. And, you know, it makes for a pretty bad combination. So I do respect Jason Parker for being able to remove his own personal feelings from the business of doing his job so good for him because that that should be respected back to Derek Cole very quickly I want to mention this you should absolutely go follow him on Twitter at primetime D Cole he's been shouting out or more likely or more aptly jawing at Kurt Andrews this guy's been popping off Santonico has quickly become one of the most dangerous, one of the most feared individuals in general admission wrestling, and for good reason. When you look at what this man can do, his undefeated record spread out over seven matches. He is 7-0. and oh. Basically, no one has been able to get close to him. I don't think a single one of his matches, maybe one, has gone past the three-minute mark. So... It's quite a quite a tall order for Derek Cole. You know what else makes him so dangerous is how versatile he is. And I don't just mean in terms of his wrestling ability. This guy trained in Europe, and if you didn't know this, Santanico is fluent in five languages. So we were able to talk to him briefly before this match when in German he gave us a little insight into, uh, into his mentality. We'll have the subtitles here for you. Diesen Stil genagelt oder getackert, das weiß ich jetzt nicht mehr genau. Und hab die dann mit ins Stadion gebracht. Ja, und so hat sich das eingebürgert. Ne? Äh, wenn ich gewusst hätte, was da draus entsteht, dann hätte ich da mir ein Patent draus geben lassen. Ne? Also, war das 76 zu St. Pauli gegangen? Ja, ich habe in der Hafenstraße gewohnt. Well, Santanico, I mean, the man speaks five languages. And apparently he is uh, capable of of talking trash in all of them. I'll tell you what though, none of those languages will do him any good against Derek Cole right now. A man as athletic, as fast, as fit as anyone Santanico has ever seen. I can guarantee you that. And Derek Cole, here's the amazing thing about him. The man's just 26 years old. 
And somehow in that time, he's found enough time to play professional basketball, professional football, run track professionally, and be a professional wrestler, during which time he has become the longest reigning PPW Tag Team Champion of all time. Derek Cole looking for a neck breaker, but instead gives him a big strike to the back of the neck. But now Cole gets caught in the wrong position as Santonico with a brain buster. And now look at the athleticism of Santonico. This man has been everywhere on earth. He knows every fighting style known to man. And some probably known only to killer whales. I don't know that for sure. That's just some speculation I have. Derek Cole rolls out knowing how dangerous Santonico is. And now Santonico going to follow him. But Derek Cole baited him in. What a spear. Well, Jason Parker... He's gotten reset after his conversation with Kurt Andrews earlier. Jason, please tell us our main event for next week. I know you all saw my conversation with Kurt earlier. Look, I watched the product too, you know. So you all know that I may not like the way the Flyboy goes about things, but if the dude is winning, he has the right to challenge for the title at some point. But it is not acceptable to walk out of a match you're scheduled for. That just cannot happen. So next week, Flyboy is back in singles action, and I'll put him against a guy who would never consider walking out of a match like that. Vic Cassidy of War will be the guy. Derek Cole coming back with a beautiful twisting face buster. And look at Cole's feeling confident, but next week we will get to see Flyboy versus Vic Cassidy. Wow, I am looking forward to that. And you know what, it's exactly what Flyboy deserves. And poetic justice to have Vic Cassidy, half of one of the most dangerous tag teams in the world, having to go against a man who walked out on his partner in the middle of a tag match. That is exactly what I want to see from, from Flyboy next week. Derek Cole now, oh, beautiful transition into a cross arm breaker. Santonico does a great job to roll over, but Derek Cole, he's one step ahead of him. Transitions into the grounded hammerlock, and now he's got Santonico's other arm. That's the right arm that is so crucial in the Crimson Abyss. And Derek Cole going to put some real pressure on it, bending the elbow backwards. Derek Cole's got to be feeling good right now. Even Santonico couldn't out-wrestle him in that scenario. And Santonico, one of the best mat wrestlers in the world. Derek Cole now with his rear chin lock applied. Trying to drive the air out of the big man. I got to say, Derek Cole, you would expect someone with his relative lack of experience and his relative youth to not approach this very well. But he has approached this match like a professional. And that's exactly what we've come to expect from prime time. And now Santanico from the corner. He's setting it up. Santanico gives him the big knee. And now Santanico catches him up on the shoulder. Crimson coronation. And look at this disrespectful cover of Derek Cole, and Cole kicked out. Santonico thought he had the match won right there. And to be fair to him, for most men, that is enough to put him away. That is enough to do the job. But Derek Cole is not like most men. This is exactly why I was so excited to see this main event. Coming up next, by the way, the highly anticipated sit-down interview with Omega Woods and Yun Son Park. For the first time ever, we are gonna see that in the ring. I am so excited to see this, folks. I don't know exactly what is going to come, but it is going to be, I think, a whole lot of fireworks. Santanico with the stump puller. Derek Cole is working on Santanico's arm earlier. Now Santanico working on the leg of Derek Cole, you know, for someone who has competed in so many different professional sports, Derek Cole has almost no history of injuries anywhere, which is very interesting. It's incredibly rare for someone like this. Cole cut, blocked by Santonico and a beautiful thrust kick. This is where the experience really pays off. And we'll get a look at it here. Nice strike caught by Cole and now up onto the ropes goes Santonico. Cole. Sends him through. And now Derek Cole, he's lining something up here as Santonico gets to his feet. Derek Cole, Tope Suicida, rolled all the way through. That is a man at six foot four. Unbelievable. 
The fans absolutely love it. This is what we were expecting from our main event. Santanico able to drop Derek Cole with the reverse DDT, almost out of instinct. Again, that's where experience really helps in a match like this. So now Santanico using this opportunity to catch his breath a little bit as it was probably taken out of him by Derek Cole and that Tope Suicida. Back into the ring he goes. Santanico throwing a strike. Derek Cole comes in for the spear. Santanico caught him back suplex and he hangs on. Derek Cole not prepared for this. German and he hung on again. Santanico now turns him around. Vertical suplex. Look at that triumvirate. Is there anyone more dangerous right now than Santanico? It's a short list, but now in the corner he goes. Cole, he was bent down. Wrong position here. Santanico, crimson coronation. And again, with that lazy cover pushing down on the chest of Derek Cole. But this time, the crimson coronation was enough. Wow. What a match. And I am so happy that we saw it. This is why I was so excited for this main event. And no one should feel any shame about losing to Santanico. This man has shown that he continues to be one of the deadliest on the planet. And so for Derek Cole, Keep your head up. Derek Cole is probably the most exciting prospect we have right now. So to put him in a situation like this against Santanico in the main event, I mean, what more can you say? This is what an incredible match this was. Folks, we will get you our sit-down interview coming up next. Omega Woods and Yunsan Park in the ring together. But first, I have this announcement hot off the heels of After Party. And before we get to Northern Lights, we have one stop before we get there. And it is in the capital, Washington, D.C., for America the Beautiful 2. It'll be the second time we've held this event and the first time that the GAW Academy will be a part of it. It will be an exclusive Academy show that is coming on Monday, July 5th. So make sure you tune in. We are so excited to bring that to you one day after Independence Day. And now, without further ado, let's bring you into the ring where Yunsan Park and Omega Woods are finally going to get face to face and figure this all out. First off, I want to thank you both for joining us here. This is the first time we've ever done something like this. I want to start with Omega Woods. You started this whole issue when you called out Yunsan Park last month, and you say the whole reason is to try to go straight to the top. But why Yunsan Park specifically? You're right, partner. It could have been anyone else. But I wanted you specifically, Park, because you specifically symbolize what the GAW Academy is and what it's not. Please explain. Everyone knows that you're the man who won the Cruiserweight Championship your first night in the company. You became the most talked about wrestler in GAW, if only for a week or two, and you introduced everyone to the GAW Academy itself. That's why it's you, Park. We wouldn't be here without you. Now, I want to prove that I'm the man to take this company forward as you do your best to hold us back. <laughs> See, you keep saying that. You keep saying that I'm trying to hold people back. I could. I could try if I wanted. I could pull some strings to get title matches. Hell, I was approached to potentially be the commissioner at the beginning of this season. I didn't want any of that, specifically because people like you would accuse me of doing exactly what you think I'm doing so you can stop hiding behind your tired slogans and tell me exactly what you want from me now. Park, you, pardon, are the face of the GAW Academy. Your name is synonymous with success. My name, everywhere I've been, is synonymous with winning. But I've never been in a place with so much talent. All these guys have different strategies for how to rise above the rest. Putting you down is mine. It's nothing personal, huh? 
It's nothing personal, partner. Oh, but it is personal. I don't know if you're lying or you've just become so disconnected from the intense personal nature of the fight game, but either way, that's bullshit and you know it. Every time we come out into this ring to fight, we put our lives at risk. Whether it's something catastrophic that happens in the ring or the death by a thousand blows of the constant grind of this sport, you and I may not wake up the next morning when we finally meet in the ring, and you know that as well as I do. So whether you like it or not, our fight will be personal. So I expect to see that killer instinct that people tell me you're so famous for. You're barking up the wrong tree, Haas. I told you it's not personal because if it was, you wouldn't be waking up the next morning. I would give my life to win my match, and I have a lot more to give than you. You wouldn't stand in there until you're an inch from death because you have something to go home to. You can't give yourself to this sport like I have. So I don't ever want to hear you talk about my motivation ever again. Oh, I'm not questioning your motivation, partner. I'm questioning how you could outwork someone that has so much to live for. In those moments when legends are made, I have a country behind me to push me forward. You have nothing. And when I force you to go to that dark place where you don't know if you're going to wake up tomorrow, you can never dig as deep as I will.